transportation to transmission. And then on our final day tomorrow, we'll put them together and talk about translation and transmission. Though there's so many overlaps, I'm sure that will already start today. It's my pleasure and honor to introduce Jenny Kiazzo, who is the Hershey Professor of Buddhist Studies at Harvard University. And did I also hear Associate Dean now? Yeah. <laughs> wow, okay. Of the Divinity School, not all of Harvard. Of the Divinity School, well, that's already quite, quite big. <laughs> um, Janet has been a pioneer in Tibetan studies in so many uh, ways, starting with her early work on Terma and uh, opening that area up to the inquiry of other scholars and to the general public. She's probably best known for her pioneering and groundbreaking work on autobiography with the publication of Apparitions of the Self. And, uh, I sort of think of that a little bit like opening a, a bayou, that she opened the door for this incredible subfield in Tibetan studies to um, suddenly take off and flourish. And now it really is a, a thriving area of inquiry and translation. She is also now um, doing something similar for the field of Tibetan medicine and her book uh, that will be coming out soon, Being Human in a Buddhist World, explores uh, the role of medicine and also questions of early modernity in Tibet. And throughout all of this, she's had a sustained interest in gender, uh, in all these different uh, domains, and of course is co-editor of uh, anthology on women in Tibet. She has been a generous mentor to many and uh, is a wonderful uh, scholar to read Tibetan texts with. Um, one of the real leading thinkers and theorists, I would say, among scholars of Tibetan studies. So please join me in welcoming Jenny Kiazzo. Thank you very much. And thank you, Holly, for the very kind introduction. Uh, it's really, I want to thank Sadra for, and all of the organizers for inviting me. This is a, a really interesting conference, and I'm really glad to be here. Really, in some ways, historic moment of scholars and practitioners, practitioner scholars, scholar practitioners getting together and recognizing all the multiple connections that we have with each other and attempting to forge a current conversation is really great. I'll also say, for me, it's seen so many people from a long time ago. I feel like my life is flashing before my eyes, and I'm just worried that I shouldn't die right after this conference. <laughs> but anyway, it's really a pleasure to be here and to, and to be part of this. And I also wanted to just pay homage to the surroundings and the weather. It's just like unbelievable outside today. So the ground, the she, the whatever. Uh, and uh, I didn't, I, maybe I didn't read carefully enough my instructions, but I, actually my talk will be both about translation and transmission, maybe a little bit more about tra transmission. Uh, but I wanted to start off, you know, in very much also responding to many of the things that were said yesterday and lots of interesting ideas came up that there's a lot more for all of us to talk about. Uh, and I'll add to something that a lot of people were already saying about how translation is a very, very special pleasure. And, and in my case, definitely really the most pleasurable thing that I do in the field. And uh, why that is, is maybe in some ways not so much of a mystery, you know, both talking about both oral translation and textual translation. Oral translation in particular, you know, I thought that... Um, Catherine Hart, um, um, uh, Dal Dalton's uh, comments yesterday about becoming invisible. Uh, there's also what goes along with that, the very, very special pleasure, like when you put yourself aside and you're listening to what the teacher is saying, there's a way in which you're merging with the teacher's ideas, the teacher's being, the teacher's way of talking. And it's a really great chance to really get very, very close to the, 
teacher where you're trying to, you're, you're really speaking for the teacher. And that's, you know, that in itself, I mean, it's such a relief, like not to be me and to sp speak someone else's words, especially someone really amazing. So that's really great. And then textual translation too is a great pleasure and a great, trans a, a great privilege. Um, I think uh, it, it's, it's not so much, I feel, a, a moment of intimacy with the uh, author, but with the text itself, listening to the text, letting the text speak to you. Um, there was, a, a, of the many, many interesting uh, issues that Professor Bellos brought, brought up yesterday, one of them was about the problem of, or the question of why we have these foreign terms, xenisms in our tran translations. He mentioned a few reasons, but one thing I, didn't, I don't think he mentioned was that uh, it's sometimes the case where we actually know what a term means, say, in Tibetan. We understand it very well, but we can't find an English word that kind of captures all the resonances or even the proper resonances, and, and, and we just feel that it's better to just leave the word in the original language. I've always tried as much as possible to translate terms because they are so in interesting. One example, um, just uh, harking back to my own experience translating the life story of Jigme Lingpa, there's just a term like, for example, Nyam Ur, which means something, it literally means experience. Actually, Ur is a kind of hard word to translate. It's, so, it's like an onomatopoetic word, I think, for something intensifying or and exactly what that means. And I just re, re, remember being with um, Kempel Belden Sherup, who was extremely generous with me and read the whole text together. I had a long um, period uh, in translating text actually with him and trying to pin him down. What exactly does Nyam Ur mean? And you know, what are the linguistic parts? And you know, also in many other con contexts, like as, trying to pin down the grammar, the syntax, why does he put the, these words in exactly the way that he does? And it being a sort of moment of humor and laughter when we realized that the topic that we were talking about was some kind of really, um, you know, Jigme Lingpa is talking about spacing out in, 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 into the unarticulated, you know, you know, em emptiness where everything is all the same and there's no la language at, at, at all and this is just a space of experience. And I'm saying, but wait a minute, I want to get the exact meaning of this exact word. And he's saying like, you know, that's really not the spirit of what you're um, translating. But I, I really felt that I, I needed to get the words as close to the me metaphors of the original text as possible um, and, and to convey that, you know, extra linguistic experience that it, it, it was trying to convey. So it's a very hard task, and I certainly agree with what many people said yesterday about trans translation certainly being an art, and maybe that's one of the great pleasures of it, too. It's, it's a very artistic thing. It's a very creative act. Okay, so anyway, my talk today is going to be on the topics of transli translation, transmission, and maybe framed in the larger category of tradition, which I'm not actually going to talk about so much, but certainly tra tradition in the sense of preserving or transmitting uh, something from the past to another place and what is entailed with all of those things. And maybe also I'll be gesturing to issues about uh, some of our assumptions about authenticity. A lot of people were talking yesterday about getting something right and also about authority, getting it right, getting it good. And I'll, I'll, I'll be talking both out of uh, certain categories that uh, come out of Tibetan and Buddhist uh, history more generally, and uh, I'll be sort of mixing them with some of my own thoughts where I'm trying to carry what these things mean a little bit further. Um, what is transmission, really? And how does transmission relate to the act of translation? Um, how do you get transmission? Uh, and I also want to try to talk about what some of these things might mean outside of the ritual context, the specific even Tibetan context. You know, how do we generalize a notion of transmission that might, in fact, be relevant to people who are translating texts completely different from Tibetan Buddhism and so, so on? Might some of what Tibetans say about uh, transmission and also what we experience as part of the um, act of translation, how that might have something to contribute to larger questions about translation more generally in the humanities, let's say. Uh, and so transmission of knowledge, and I want to say that transmission of knowledge is 
I, I shy away from the word intention uh, for reasons I tried to um, begin to talk about yesterday. Um, uh, but I, I think of knowledge more as a kind of space, a, a certain space, a certain orientation, perhaps even a certain desire, a certain, it's very, I think it's very important how we conceptualize what it is that's being transmitted. And also the relationship between the linguistic dimensions of what's being transmitted and the extra linguistic um, dimensions and how those two things relate to each other. There's also certainly something very important about time. Transmission is a very Janus-faced kind of phenomenon where it's looking both uh, to the past. This is where tradition comes in, something that you're maybe receiving from the past and you're also passing on to the future. So it's going in two directions. And that's also true, of course, of tran translation. Translation is also taking a text that's pre-existent and giving it to the future. It's a, 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 I, I really want to say that Translation is really a subtype of transmission. In a certain sense, translation is maybe a more limited phenomenon because it's very much dealing specifically with words and the transformation of those words into another form. And maybe in a certain sense, trans translation is more oriented towards the future than it is to the past, although certainly issues of the, of, of the past come in. Um, I, I will also just note that um, there's a lot more uh, that Tibetan's, Tibetan Buddhism says about transmission than about translation. Transmission is very much about the whole relationship between guru and disciple. Transmission is very fundamental to the primary um, presumptions about what education entails altogether, what it means to learn. Uh, what we find in Tibetan texts about translation is far more limited. Um, uh, that it's very interesting, and I, I will talk about it a little bit. Uh, but it comes up mostly in you know very specialized contexts of translating from one language to another, especially in the context of canonical translation. Uh, uh, and uh, whereas transmission, you might say, is also about translating the content of the canon. It does relate to the canon to the degree that the canon is understood to be Buddha word or Buddha realization or enlightened, but, but again, it's not always in a word-to-word -word way, but it also entails a, a kind of reckoning with a deep meaning or deep content. Anyway, these are just very general con concepts. Let me, I'm gonna go through a couple of sets of cat categories and just think about what some of them mean. Um, for example, there is a um, common uh, threefold uh, uh, set of terms which are not invented in Tibet but are found in Indian Buddhism, especially Mahayana Buddhist sutra tradition, which is related to the whole issue at hand having to do with the nature of Buddha word or Buddha vachana. Three ways that Buddha vachana is created. And here the, the whole question of how Buddha vachana actually comes into existence and the whole issue of the authorial, quote unquote, intention or not, and so on, is very relevant. Three kinds of Buddha word, uh, th through mouth, uh, through blessing or inspiration, and through permission. Okay? So what does mouth mean? Mouth means, in particular, uh, what the Buddha spoke through his mouth, so to speak. So it's just a very simple idea of the actual human Buddha spoke himself in his mouth out of his mouth to others. Uh, but then there's also this idea of blessing or inspiration, which has to do with, often it's the case you see in the Buddha sutras a lot, that the Buddha is actually sitting there, the Buddha goes into meditation, and somebody else speaks. And it's actually specifically out of the blessing or the inspiration, sometimes the word pratibana, or some version thereof is used, where um, uh, someone else actually speaks the scripture. This is so, for example, in the Heart Sutra, where it's actually spoken by Avalokiteshvara. And there already, I think you have really interesting issues come up. What does it mean for the Buddha to be inspiring the other person and the other person is like a mouthpiece and speaks it? And maybe a kind of translation is already happening because what you're getting from the Buddha, it seems, is not the words themselves. You're making up, the, well, you, Avalokiteshvara, is ma making up the words uh, out of this inspiration. What does that mean? And then finally, this notion of permission, which, um, 
is a little bit more distant from the Buddha, that the Buddha gave somebody permission to preach, or the Buddha told someone else that he should teach, or it's usually he, uh, should teach a particular text. Permission, I think, is a very key term, and I want to return to that in a little while in my comments. But let me go through a, a number of other sets of such ca categories. Um, uh, this is a common trio in Tibetan Buddhism. I don't know of it in Sanskrit, Indian uh, Buddhism, in Indian Tantra, the, the trio of Wang, Lung, and Chi. Okay? This is very squarely about tra transmission, per se. Wang is uh, Abhisheka, the ritual initiation. And it's usually in this order. You get the Wang first. I think you might argue with me on this, but you get the Wang first, you get the ritual Abhisheka, and then you get a Lung, which is a really interesting thing that I believe Tibetans made up, is there's this idea that you need to have the whole text read to you. And usually it's the Lama will do it. There's a group of students there, and he goes really, really fast through this, this text. And, you, and, you, and you're kind of sitting there, and you're like wondering, what's going on, and why am I doing this? You know, he's going... <laughs> and, but you're getting the look, okay? And then tree is, tree is the explanation. So that, of course, makes a lot of sense. You know? So you know, when he's doing the lung, you can't hear what he's saying, even if you're a completely native speaker and you know this tradition very well. You, it's, he's going too, too fast. But tree is when they slow down and give you the explanation. Um, and I, you know, what is going on in that uh, context of lung? That's what I want to sort of focus on just for a second. Um, I think it's something about being there. I think Lung has a great deal to do with permission. Somehow, the, and it's sort of like you've been dragged over, not the coals, but you've been dragged over the words. You've been, you and the Lama together have, you know, either spoken or heard the word together, each of the words, and it kind of gives you like the key to, you're allowed now to read this. So there's something about, um, permission, and, I, I, and, it's just, and, and it's really about the fact of being there. It's not really what you're getting in some way. Anyway, it's something to think, think about. Let me just um, keep it out there as a question, what's, what's going on in Lung? Uh, but so a larger question, you know, all of these kinds of transmission many people get. In, you know, usually there's a lot of people at a Wang, often many, many people. There's many people at a lung, many people at a tree. And I'm just wondering, um, you, you know, what is the difference between the different ways that different people receive transmission? You know, how do we know when transmission has really occurred? Uh, or transmission is successful, whatever that might mean. Or is everybody in the room receiving the transmission in the same way? In other words, is it merely that you have to go through the ritual? And as long as you've been there, even if you've not been concentrating, you've, you've gotten the trans transmission or not. Um, we do read a lot of stories in Tibetan Buddhist uh, biography, hagiography, about very special moments of transmission when somebody, like I think in the story of Machi, Lubtren, she's getting a tr transmission, I believe it's a Wang, and she walks out in the middle, right, Sarah? Or does she fly out? Yeah, she flies out, right? You know, and she doesn't need to hear the rest. She got it, you know. So that's clearly a story that her transmission was clearly superior to everyone else. But, but what is, but what, uh, who is there? What, what is really going on in that? Uh, sometimes we also read in tantric sources of a kind of physiological, from the tantric perspective, description of what actually happens in transmission. There is something about the, the tantric channels and the tigles and the chakras or certain kind of bodily experiences or visions. Uh, and that's what I think is really interesting and curious. Um, you know, how is it the case that when you're in a room and a llama is saying something or showing you something or even just looking at you or clunking something on the top of your head, that it actually changes your physiology? Your, your, body, your, you know, your substances in your body, or your very experience, or maybe the actual structure of your inner subtle body. How does that happen? How, does, how, how do words or some sort of action that you know, your relationship with another person affects you so deeply? 
I think that's a really interesting question. Um, okay, another, I'm not going to answer these questions, I'm just going to raise them. Um, uh, uh, another trio, I think this is the last one I have here, a uh, really interesting one comes from Nyingma sources in general. It's also an account of the formulation or creation of Buddha word. And it's also about types of transmission. So um, the first one is mind to mind transmission called the Gewa Gong Gongyu in Tibetan. The second is the so called transmission in symbols, Ringzing Daigyu. And the third is into the ears of people, Kangsat Nyankung du Gyuba. Okay. So the mind to mind transmission is said to be a, a totally direct and unmediated transmission. And the things that are said about it is that in mind to mind transmission, there is no difference between the teacher and the disciple. They're exactly the same, they have the same realization but it's just something that's continually happening. That alone, again, is a really, really interesting idea. You know, why is, um, why, why do they bother to call that transmission? If like, you know, you have two people, but they're exactly the same, why does there have to be transmission between them? Just one of my many questions, okay? The second one, I'll just go over them and I'll talk a little more about those in a moment. Uh, the second one, the transmission in symbols, this is all kinds of things, uh, and also really fascinating, everything from showing you like an object or some, for example, a mirror, which is not just any object, but you know, someone flashes a mirror, you know, and obviously you see yourself in, in the mirror, oh, and you realize some really important thing, or it might be a gesture that the teacher does towards you, or even like a glance, a special kind of glance, there's lots of stories of, of the siddhas, it's not only in the sort of conventional ritual context, but you're walking in the market and some dakini of some kind just, you know, sees you and, you know, goes, goes like, like that, and then you, you, you get the whole transmission. It, it, it can be linguistic, but it's usually a very short and pithy phrase, like, you're an idiot, you know, or something. Uh, uh, or something, or, you know, practice hard, and, and some, somehow it just strikes you. Uh, some, sometimes it's bird talk. A lot of the stories in the Nyingma tradition talk about, like, some bird comes and it's sort of quack, 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 or, you know. But for, for you, you're actually getting this transmission. Okay, and um, the third one is into the ears of people re re refers to when a teaching is actually conveyed in full-fledged linguistic form. So when you tell or write or, you know, give a full-fledged teaching in, in, in the way that it would be encoded then in a text of Buddha Vachana. Um, in each case, you would say that there is a kind of translation going on um, in this trans transmission, but the closer that it gets to the word by word, I would say the more mundane and clumsy it is, the less effective in a certain way Certainly the less, immediate, uh, the, the less immediate, the more mediated, the less bodily or mind bodily or whatever you mean by mind and the more linguistic. And so here we have to wonder if translation of text is something that we understand as a totally linguistic activity, uh, but on the same t at, at the same time it, it demands transmission. There's some way that you need to have in some sense a transmission or you need to have in some way taken up the text in some profound way in order to be able to translate it, you want to understand it at least. How does that non-linguistic -ling form that this scheme is whole, holding out, how, how does that get translated into words? What is the bridge? Um, what is the pathway from this completely, explicitly non-linguistic form of realization into words? It's just, again, something that bears thought. Um, and I think at least one clue is in these descriptions of the, um, the t these three kinds of tr transmission, especially in the first one. Why are they, ca you know, conceiving of this kind of mind-to-mind -mind transmission as a transmission? I think that one of the things that they're saying, this is just a, a thought that I've had for a very long time, is there's some kind of idea that experience itself enlightened experience itself or knowledge or whatever that is, is fundamentally communicative. 
there's something about knowledge that is always in process. It's not static. I mean, you could, I could build a big argument about this from the perspective of compassion. You know, you always have to teach. Actually, uh, Bob Thurman yesterday was citing the, you know, the really great passage from Vimala Kirti where um, Shariputra can't talk and the goddess tells him, you idiot, you know, you have to talk. You always have to be talk talking. And even Vimala Kirti's great silence is itself a form of communication. You have to be transmitting. It's, it's even beyond compassion. There's something in the very nature of knowledge that has to be transmitted. I think that's really important. And I would also add that there's something in the very nature of knowledge or experience that has permission in it, or at least the potential of tr translation. That it's, it's there to be translated. OK. I want to also dwell on the symbolic for a moment. Why is that such a kind of key moment in these accounts of the formulation of Buddha word? Um, uh, and I would say that this s symbolic form of transmission is, it's mediated, but only slightly. It's kind of an effort to get away from the, the mediation or give as little mediation as possible. But it's, I think, really important for the question that I raised before of how does this completely non-linguistic experience get translated into something mediated? How does the immediate get translated into something um, mediated? Um, and the symbolic tr transmission is something that has a kind of foot in both wor worlds, so to speak. It's almost as if you don't want to say anything at all, but you're going to say something, but it's going to be minimal. And also, this, I think, is a very fruitful place to think about how this relates to more general experience, not only in the Tibetan Buddhist context, um, in a very general human way. For example, do we, just as people, in general, have a special liking or a special use of uh, the subtle nudge, the raised eyebrow, over the explicit propositional sentence? You know, is there something really nice about that when somebody, I, I actually can't do that, like raise one eye, eyebrow, but those who can do that, it's really great. The rest of the face like stays the way it is in the, you know. Uh, well, one thing we can say, what's so nice about that is it's, it's very intimate. It goes from one person to another who both already have had some kind of deep understanding between them. It often happens in a case where the explicit utterance would be inappropriate, either because you want to communicate something privately, to someone in a crowded room where you don't want everyone else to hear, so it's only between the two of you, or it may just be in a context where there's a lot of other stuff going on and, and for you to say something would be inappropriate because someone else is speaking. But, and, and I think it also just happens in general where there's moments in our lives where talking in some sense breaches intimacy. There's something about you don't want to talk in very, very intimate moments. And I, I think that we, 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 we often strongly desire to have that kind of communication with someone else where words are not necessary at all, or perhaps where just one or two words do the trick. It's kind of a relief. And it's also, I'd say, highly pleasurable because exchanging a secret sign with a friend or speaking in code or using abbreviations um, has a certain pleasure attached to it for some reason on its own. For example, you know, my post lady comes by and I yell out to her, TGIF, you know, and she laughs. And it's not only because, you know, TGIF, thank God is fri Friday. Um, she's laughing not only because our shared pleasure that we're, yes, we're really happy that it's Friday because Saturday's coming up and we don't have to work. It's, 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 but it's also about the fact that we share this code and, and the fact that we both know it. And there's something really pleasure about sharing with someone else in that context. Um, anyway, what I'm trying to say is I think those insights actually help us understand why this kind of symbolic communication was also so really important in these very esoteric, tantric, uh, Tibetan um, communications. All right, so I'm going to leave that also out there, putting up a lot of things and sort of leaving them. Uh, I want to make now, this is a second larger point. Um, how many do we have for time? Um, which has to do with uh, the drive or the desire to transmit. And this is, um, relates already to this point that I was making about the mind-to-mind uh, -mind transmission. From the beginning, there's something about knowledge that wants to be communicated. 
And I'm going to give the example from my own uh, book on Jigme Lingpo, which certainly was everything about translation and tr transmission, and a very special moment in the visions of Jigme Lingpo when he has his first amazing vision of Longchenba, Longchen Ramjamba. Uh, and it, it was, in, and, and what this vision is about is both Jigme Lingpo's desire to connect with. Longchenba, but also Longchenba's own desire to transmit to him. So the, I'm, I'm reading my translation of uh, Jigme Lingpa's vision and his account of it. It says, so when I first saw him, he, he was in good health, beautiful, in a dress of the three Dharma robes. Um, if one were to look at him as if he were a Buddha, it would not be inappropriate. And I distinctly heard the sound of him praying, and he was saying, May the heart-mind continuum of the meaning to be expressed be transferred to you. May it be transferred to you. Actually, already in that, you have this whole, which I won't get into, what is this heart-mind continuum and then the meaning to be expressed. But he's saying, may that get to you. And he says, may the transmission of the words that express be completed. May it be completed. At that, so that's the end of his quote, and Jigme Lingpa says, at that, such unbearable faith and veneration arose in me that I was as if about to faint. Having no time to do prostrations, I grasped together the Lama's two hands and I placed them as a diadem on my great bliss chakra at the top of my head. And I said to him, actually this is a word that's hard to translate, Keno, Lama Keno, so I'm translating just as no. No, O oh, omniscient Dharma King, no, Lama Keno, Keno. I, I, I beseeched him, almost fainting with veneration. And to me he said, in later times someone saying that will come. So at that, in my perception, I understood, so he hears Long Chaba saying that, and he said, I understood that he was complaining. Because as he said in this text called, this, I think it's called Kamdu Med, Medo Trengwa, I translate it as congestion with a rosary of flowers. It's a particular work written by Long Chaba. Um, as, as he said there, there were beings low in merit during the time that he actually was alive who had lacked faith and devotion due to the force of their perpetrating much perversity, his heart had become dejected. And so I said to him, remembering your kindness in teaching and benefit beings in, in, in your seven repository, your, your Zhe Dun, and all of your Ningtik treasures, I continually am in veneration of your great qualities, equal to those of a real Buddha indeed. So he's hearing Longchenba complaining that he, his, his message never got across. He didn't have the right disciples. And Jigme Ling was trying to comfort him. He said, well, you know, I have read all your works, and, you know, this is sort of the thing you can imagine, you know, no one ever reads your books, but many lifetimes ahead, I've read it, and it really meant a lot to me. And so he's comforting Long Chaba, don't worry, there are people who read your books. <laughs> and, and when he says that to Long Chaba, Long Chaba says to him, oh, no, noble son, just now the understanding of the continuum of the meaning has been transferred to you. So he just he says, the transmission has just taken place. So implant a life separate practice and teach widely to fortunate ones. And by the way, your songs come forth extremely well. So he praises him. That was nice. And as he was saying that, I, Jigme Lingba, thought to ask him for more teachings, but the vision of his body sunk into space like an optical illusion. So it was gone. Bam. And um, it's really a kind of you know, amazing vision. Um, but what I, it, it was, and it's really about Long Chamba wanting to give transmission. And what was he missing in his life? What, you know, it, what he's missing is portrayed in terms of kind of life issues. It's not some esoteric account of, you know, getting the, the meaning that causes the, you know, some kind of, you know, experience of Rikpa or something like that. It's more about just having disciples who are good people, something that makes you happy. I want to take this moment to talk about this from the, you know, a really striking um, account of the, um, about the uh, nature of autobiography because this re relates to um, Long Chimba's concerns about his life and whether his life had meaning or, you know, actually, again, I'm thinking about Bob Thurman's talk last night. It was really very touching talking about his life being that, you know, he failed, but he has, but he still has hope that we will can continue to carry out his ideas. But it's a really important thing, you know, thinking back on your life. I'm going to look at, very briefly, at a work by uh, Jacques Derrida, or, which is an analysis of Eke Homo by Nietzsche. So that's Nietzsche's autobiography. And, um, and he brings to the fore, with, this is the idea that it's, um, 
very relevant, I think, to what I'm trying to get at, which is it, he's something he calls a completion of contract. It's as if your life, well, let, let me just read uh, what he says. Um, and this, this is a little bit arcane, but let me just go through just a few lines from this. Um, Derrida says, he never, you know, say one in one's autobiography, but Nietzsche in, in particular, never knows in, in, in the present, with present knowledge, uh, whether anyone will ever honor the inordinate credit that he extends to himself in his name, but also necessarily in the name of another. Now, the thing about the name I'm going to have to skip. But he says, the consequence of this are not difficult for, to foresee. If the life that he lives and tells to himself autobiography, they call it, cannot be his life in the first place, except as the effect of a secret contract, a credit account which has been both opened and encrypted. This really does sound like sort of the term of tradition. Uh, a credit account which has been opened and encrypted, an indebtedness, an alliance. Then as long as this contract has not been honored, and it, it can only be honored by another, for example, by you, if this credit account that he's opened has not been honored by someone else, then his life is a mere prejudice. His life actually doesn't, in fact, totally take place. Something about, and, and I'm translating that back into the Tibetan context, something about knowledge, enlightenment, is a kind of contract that you take out with others, that you need others to receive. You need it to be received by another in order for the contract to be completed. Um, I. It's the genius of, of Jigme Lingpa to realize that he had to um, uh, comfort Longchenpa and, and also this kind of remarkable dimension of that vision that, Long, uh, that Jigme Lingpa has is of this sort of time disparity. He's seeing Longchenpa in, in the past and even while Jigme Lingpa is there in the future trying to sort of make contact with him, and uh, Longchenpa, and he's saying, hi, you know, Longchenpa, I'm, I'm here, and you were, you were great, hi. And, and, and Longchenpa says, in later times, someone saying that will appear. It's, it's as if he's hearing an echo in the future of something that's going to happen, but, and, and he's taking comfort from that now. It's, it's almost as though that they're not connecting until, again, you know, Jing Lingpa puts his hand on his head and so on and says, I'm here, I'm here, and then somehow that transmission happens. It's actually in that desire, in that connection between these two human beings. Uh, I want to, I'm going to skip a little bit of what I am, um, what I have planned here, because I really want us to have a enough time to talk about some of these ideas. Let me bring up one final issue, or one, you know, set of categories as a ways to think about some of the issues that are important both to translation and transmission. And these are just my sort of general cat categories is the distinction, but also the interconnection between communicativeness and receptivity. Uh, and um, I was really struck again by what Professor Bellow said yesterday when he was talking about the adaptive translation, that kind of translation that is you know, both trying to receive and represent what the text itself says, but also that really wants to sort of transform itself into the idiom of the target audience. He says that, in, especially in the case of the adaptive translation, it has a lot to do with reading and writing practices as well. The ability to read well and the ability to write well. And he actually, I think, was talking about the material conditions when in a long time ago when people were the way that they translated but i think that it, it also has something to do with the actual ca ca capabilities of the translator very very important to be a really good reader and also a, a really good writer to know what uh formulating you know teachings what formulating ideas what communicating is all about um and um issues about um, language skills, you know, the ability to come up with words that are appropriate in a particular context that really are precisely targeted for another person, the ability to sort of see what another person needs to hear and sort of pull out of the air those words that the person needs to hear. That's the whole general notion of mengak or the special kind of instruction. Um, the um, idea of um, 
inspiration that I already spoke about, uh, being in touch with a kind of inspiration that will inform the ways that you're um, articulating particular Buddhist teachings. I think also the ability, which is very much tied to the formulation of Buddhist speech, is this notion of emanation or nirmana. It's not only about what you say, but how you present your body uh, to others, So, and bodhisattvas or other high teachers who are able to kind of change their body to, pres to look in a certain way. Uh, and um, I'm sort of uh, halting here because I realize that time is running. I have a whole bunch of other things to say. I'm actually going to skip a bunch of stuff, okay? I'm going to go to one last thing, and I, I really want us to talk about this, and I can give you the full version later. Um, I, on the other side of communicativeness, what is involved in receptivity? So let me just end on this idea. Uh, the importance, uh, you can get a lot of ideas from various sources in Buddhist theory or Buddhist ideas about how one cultivates receptivity, how one cultivates the ability to hear what's being communica communicated, take it in, and then somehow translate it and give it to someone else. Certainly, we read lots of works on attention, faith, the whole idea of being an empty vessel, not being filled up so you have room to receive. Uh, there's a really interesting idea that I'm taking from um, Theravada Abhidharma, uh, actually in Buddha Gosa, there's a really in in interesting idea called Kaya Vidnyapti and Vach Vidnyapti, which has to do, it's not the usual Vidnyapti that we hear about in um, Yogacara kinds of ideas, but, but um, inklings about the bo how, to, how to read someone else's body and how to read someone else's speech, how to see in the very gestures what they're communicating and how to hear in, in their voice even before they say something, what they're going to say. So being very attuned to very um, minute and, and finely grained signals that you're getting from the teacher, uh, which I think is, it goes back to what I was saying about um, the act of oral translation, when you're there in the presence of the teacher itself, it becomes particularly re relevant. Um, and, and I think something also about the puzzle that I raised about how does what the teachers say translate into your own, not only your experience, but even your physiology, your actual physical makeup. Something about receiving or modeling the actual bodily being of the teacher. And here I'm going to give you an example from Tibetan medicine, which I found very striking, a very well-developed tradition in the Tibetan world that has, takes a lot from Buddhism, but also has its own ideas um, about a lot of things which are a little bit different, perhaps, than the Buddhist context. Uh, but certainly the idea of mengak is really important in medicine as well. Mengak is really important because it's how the teacher conveys to you how to perform operations, how to do surgical procedures, how to, you know, massage techniques, how to, certainly taking pulse. A lot of that is a kind of bodily knowledge that has to be conveyed in, in a variety of means, verbally, but also in kind of demonstration and how important that is. And one of the pieces of advice that they give to the student of medicine, uh, just reading it from a translation of an early text on the physician's medical education, it says, if the teacher's mind is small, then make your own thoughts small. If his is big, make yours big. If he has big desires, or if he likes farming, or if he likes to fight, or if he likes the Dharma, or if he likes to play, and so on. So whatever. Whatever sort of behavior and orientation, this is a really in interesting word, by the way, orientation, that the te teacher has, by whatever means there is to please him, and in whatever order, you should follow suit and respect him. So in other words, they're saying, if he likes to fight, you should like, like to fight. If he likes the Dharma, you should like the Dharma. Something about actually becoming the teacher, I think maybe is a key to the ways that this knowledge that's being transmitted to us is being then appropriated and really naturalized in our own very bodily way of being and experience, which I think is maybe a very important skill that hard as it might be, is not something completely out of, out of reach, something that we do have access to, and maybe that's what I want to put out on the table about translation and transmission. So thank you.
So mm -hmm. thank you very much for that uh, wonderful talk. I'd uh, like to share some of my experience with uh, this whole issue of uh, transmission because uh, maybe it will uh, help to uh, a little bit uh, demythicize uh, it because transmission is certainly not an act of a teacher throwing a football to you and you catch it and, you know, now I've got it. It's a dependently arising phenomenon, as we all know from our Buddhist uh, teachings. One of my uh, great teachers was uh, Yongzhen Ling Rinpoche, the late senior tutor of uh, His Holiness. And in terms of uh, some type of transmission, I don't know if you would call it transmission, but uh, uh, the experiences that I had with him, particularly uh, in the very, very early stages when I was still learning uh, to spoken Tibetan, I'd studied written Tibetan at Harvard, but uh, when you were in his presence, he had such clarity that it gave you clarity. And even though with other people that I met, other teachers that I met, that I might not have had that same type of connection with him, because of that clarity, I could understand what he was saying. So is that a transmission? I don't know. Or when he was uh, teaching, one thing that uh, struck me very much was uh, he was giving a, uh, an explanation, an initiation explanation of uh, Vajrabhairava, Yamantaka, and he would just point around him to the various features of the palace that uh, he was describing, because obviously he could see it. And this was something which was uh, tremendously inspiring, not that I could see the mandala, but uh, it uh, also is a type of uh, transmission, in a sense, by uh, a type of uh, gesture. There's another type of experience, which is uh, in terms of uh, permission, in a sense. My, uh, another of my great teachers, Sanship Sirkon Rinpoche, would, uh, whom I was an interpreter for, for, and was very, very close with him all the time for about nine years. Uh, he would teach, and uh, he would teach for maybe an hour, two hours, something like that, and I would be interpreting. And then he would say to me, now you summarize for all the students uh, everything that I said, you know, in terms of... Uh, uh, the teaching that he was giving. So is that a transmission? Is it an authorization? Is it a permission? Or is it a training for uh, someone to be a teacher themselves? So all of these things get uh, mixed together. And in terms of a uh, oral transmission, I believe that this arose in India with the uh, whole uh, uh, situation of nothing having been written down and in order for any teaching uh, or scriptural uh, source to be passed on, you had to hear it. And so you have tuchung sherab, you know, the uh, discriminating awareness that comes from hearing. And so you had to be absolutely certain what the words were. And so for that reason, you had to listen to them. And so the tradition of lung uh, arose from that. Now, what I had always thought uh, early on uh, naively, I suppose, was that uh, there was some sort of tremendous understanding and so on that was uh, given along with uh, alone. But then the situation arose that uh, my teacher, Sanship Serkan Rinpoche, had received from his father, who was uh, a tremendous uh, uh, Kala Chakra yogi and uh, uh, incredible uh, figure of can, the uh, can we just uh, late get to the night. question yeah right Please. so right, just no i'll just, just give the very very briefly let me give this because i think this is significant so anyway he had a vision of tsongkhapa of changlekshi ningbo and uh, had a uh, special transmission of that that circle Rinpoche had and he gave to very few people i received it now the young circle Rinpoche, uh the tuku of that wanted to get that transmission i had never studied it I didn't know the text, I didn't understand the text, but I asked His Holiness's permission, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, to give the oral transmission to the young Sirkan Rinpoche, which I did. So what actually is being transmitted? This is uh, the- you Very know, good question. A very good question. What thank is you. being thank transmitted? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I, I appreciate you sharing that, and I just wanted to share actually a parallel story that you 
somehow reminded me of once being in Nepal at Shechen Monastery when Dingo Kensu Rim, Rim, Rinpoche was still alive and being in one of these large monastic assemblies and, you know, all the lay people and white people were away at the back and stuff. And uh, there was one moment when there was a, a row of very young monks amongst all the others. And there was these moments when they had their hats, their big hats on, and then they would take them off and then they would put them on. But at one moment, two young monks who were all excited about, you know, wearing the hats and they were kind of talking and joking with each other hadn't realized that everybody else in the room, it was time to take the hats off and they still had their hats on. Dingo Kensei Rinpoche up on the stage kind of caught their eye. It was really great. And, you know, and he goes to them. <laughs> you know, and then with his amazing smile, actually. And it just was, it, that for me was like the greatest trans, trans, transmission. It was so like immediate and be beautiful, even more important than uh, anything about the actual content of what they were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for um, your really interesting and insightful comments. I just uh, wanted to pick up on a couple of points. One was you were mentioning actually the the pleasure and the relief that can come about in the context of oral interpreting and not having to be yourself for a moment. And at the end, you were speaking again a little bit about this idea of becoming the teacher. Um, and that reminded me actually of something that Lama Chonam said yesterday that I thought was so beautiful. Um, <coughs> We talk about translation as being something extremely complicated and complex, and it is. Um, but also, I wrote down actually what Lama Chanam said because it was so beautiful and so simple. He said, you become the speech of the teacher, that's all. And I think that's really important that we also think about that aspect of when it really happens that you're able to actually communicate that, in a sense, that's exactly what's happening. You are becoming the speech of the teacher, and that's it's incredibly it's incredibly beautiful it's an it's an incredibly simple thing as well it is it is a great experience yeah and the other yeah, the other thing i wanted to ask actually um you mentioned also this question of extra linguistic uh communication what's right. happening what's being transmitted beyond the language and i think about that a lot um oral interpreting for a certain context especially the context of like the pointing out instructions which I would feel absolutely incompetent and incapable of translating for were it not that my teacher puts me in the situation where I have to do it. But also part of what gives me confidence is that I feel that a lot of what is actually being communicated doesn't have anything to do with me in that context specifically, that there's something very much extra uh, linguistic that is taking place. And I was wondering if you had any more comments towards that, that um, aspect of that topic. Right, well, I think I would answer both of them together. You know, it, in, in one sense, you're becoming the teacher, but in another sense, you're not. You're becoming the t speech of the teacher, but you're speaking in a language that the teacher ostensibly doesn't know. And to that degree, you are yourself, and you know what the idioms are. You know what the resonances of any particular word are. And so it, it is a case, it, you know, and, and so what does it mean to not be yourself? You know, what, what does it mean to not be yourself, but to speak in a language, I mean, short of the teacher being a totally enlightened Buddha that actually knows English, but is choosing not to speak in, in, in English for some reason. I mean, let's set that aside. Let's say the teacher, great teacher, doesn't know English. You're using your knowledge. So, so there's something of, quote unquote, you that's there, very much so, you know. And actually, I want to, even as I was speaking, I realized I don't actually want to say that any of that communication is extra linguistic in some sort of profound way, I think, to the degree that that very primal moment of mind-to-mind -mind transmission is couched as a transmission, as a movement from one to another, it is already not linguistic in the usual sense that we think of, but it's, it has some semiotics, actually, that's the word that I'm looking at. So it's not fully non-linguistic. I am also very, I've for a very long time been really influenced by people like Kristeva, who have wanted to wanted to say that there that there there is no kind of experience or knowledge that in some degree is semiotic, it's it has a kind of representation in it, it, it and the mere fact that it's moving from one to another means that some translation is having to ha happen and so there's some language involved there. Would that help? Um, thank you for the wonderful talk and I particularly um, really appreciated the. The point you made about Ringzen Dai Guba as you know, so transmission through a symbol as somehow having the feet on both sides.
fully mediated and the unmediated. And uh, it was an interesting way of looking at this uh, trio. A um, couple of things. One is I um, would like to humbly um, let you know that, that the first trio does exist in the Tibetan texts. The Buddha Vachana, the, um, the scriptures that are spoken by the Buddha oh, yeah. from his own. Because you mentioned it's it's in the, not found in the Tibetan tradition, but in the Chinese Mahayana tradition. Oh, no, no, no. The Did first trio. Uh, what? Yeah, you, you said, yeah, uh, in, anyway, in, but it doesn't matter. But no, I it's want... found in Tibetan, but Tibetans did not in, invent it. It's already in, in Indian Buddhism before it comes to the... Yes, comes, comes to... your reference was more to the Chinese tradition, but it doesn't matter. I didn't say that's, that. That's, um, um, I know what but, I said. No. Uh, okay, sorry. Actually, sorry, I don't know what, what I said. Yeah, uh, but it is, it is there right. in the Indian uh, Tibetan tradition coming from the Indian tradition, the three yeah. Buddha okay, Vachanas. Okay. But uh, my question has more to do with... Um, some of them are more kind of... Um, language related questions for example like uh, when we were um, producing the Tibetan rendering of the title of this conference we were struggling with the word transmission which you know me being a native Tibetan if there is a word I should automatically get it so which means it doesn't exist in Tibetan but on the other hand the discourse on transmission is so widespread you know when you look at you know, um, when you think about Tibetan tradition, you know, transmission of this, transmission of that, but transmission as a verb, as a sort of a standalone construct, um, seems to be problematic. Guba so, is, gu is not? Well, to guba is to come through, but guba as a noun is really kind of a, um, um, a lineage or, yeah, one could say guba is a transmission. Yes. If we take guba as a transmission, yeah. Then, um, okay, so, I, you know, so if you translate Guba as a trans, uh, transmission, then it's the same as the lineage, um, a sort That's of right. su yeah. su succession lineage. So that was one thing. Related. Yeah, okay, so, so my question, the question I have is uh, this. Um, you know, if you look at English translations of Tibetan text or Lama's teachings, I don't read that much because I read it in Tibetan, but little that I read... Um, when I look at it from my, say, a sort of a, uh, um, if I take the perspective of someone who's totally unexposed to the Tibetan world, there are words like transmissions and so on that are riddled, you know, full, full on the text. So I wonder to what extent we are using terms like this in a very specialized meaning without making the effort to somehow maintain the link to the larger context. So I'm thinking here in terms Which of... Which larger context? For example, like there's a cultural transmission. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when two cultures come into contact, yeah, right. there is a cultural transmission going on. Right. There is a lot of discussions about how knowledge gets transmitted. So this is a, a larger... So I was hoping that you would make the, the very specific, you know, uh, discussion of a transmission in the context of Tibetan tradition to this larger idea of what transmission is, for example, what the cultural trans. Maybe that's a conversation tomorrow. So that's one question I wanted to ask you. The second is, you know, sometimes I worry when we talk about, you know, transmission, the student getting it and Lama giving it. There is sometimes a sort of a maybe um, unintended, but there is a danger of reifying something. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I wonder if you have thought about that you know, potential, um, you know, wh what is it that you get it? Mm -hmm. and, and then sometimes that kind of reification kind of gives you the license not to be critical. Mm -hmm. You know, you sort of stop there. And that also has its own, you know, sort of downside. So these are the, so if you have thought about those, thank you. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I completely agree with your issues. I, I do think, you know, I, I actually think that the word transmission has a really good, you know, that does represent a major concept in Tibetan and so but the way that we use the word transmission that's a very buzzword in our you know in this context here we all know what transmission means in a very particular way I mean the larger English meaning of transmission of just you know moving something from one place to another has a very has taken on a very special meaning in the context of people who are practicing Tibetan Buddhism which I think it is already trying to relate to a different kind of cultural context where different kinds of practices are already happening. So we are, in some sense, 
cognizant of that cultural um, transmission as well. And that was also what I was trying to get at. Even, you know, cultural transmission is one thing that's a huge topic. I was actually trying to talk about bodily transmission, which, body, your, you know, the way you hold your body, the way you gesture, the way you move, the way you talk, your attitude in talking, your attitude in listening, uh, that already, in, you know, packs in lots of cultural presumptions. And in fact, for me, one of the most important things that I have ever learned is really how to listen, you know, like learning what the meaning lolos or lasso means in Tibetan, which is like, you know, yes, sir, yes, sir. It, it, it doesn't really mean yes, sir. It just means like I'm complete, you know, I'm taking what you're saying. It's not a, an attitude that I was used to growing up in, in my household, which is like, yeah, you said that, but that's wrong, that's wrong, shut up, let me, let me, let me say my, my thing. So that already is happening. Um, so maybe that's just, um, uh, what was the other point? Yeah, re well, that's the whole point. It's, it's not reifiable because it's always in process. So that's, the, that's part of the point that I'm trying to make is that if knowledge is always in process, it's always looking for a recipient. It's always looking for communication. Something has to happen and therefore it has to keep changing. And like we were talking with Catherine about this idea of it's not being you, but in a certain sense it is you. You need to have a critical you know, sort of capacity to translate well. And you are, you are going to be changing it. There's no way for that not to happen. But that, that's nothing that anyone ever expected not to be the case. Okay. Yes. Um, I just wanted to ask if you could please uh, share with uh, particularly the junior or aspiring translators in the room uh, the, I guess, personal practices, be they dharmic or very mundane, which uh, have helped you to become a person of uh, great diligence and insight so that we can sort of, you know, <laughs> become like you. Transmit now. <laughs> I made a joke, but I'm totally not joking. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 okay, you know, I mean, the only thing that I can say it, it is, I, I do believe that um, there's a really important cultivation of attention and hearing what other people are saying. That's, I don't know, this is nothing about me, but some people are better at doing than others. Some people, when you talk to someone else, you sort of see the expression on their face, you understand what they mean, and you kind of get what their emotional sort of meaning is that they're trying to convey to you. And lots of times we don't do that because we're so caught up in our own heads and our own ideas and our own desires. And so the more that we can cultivate the ability to pick up cues to sort of shut our own self up a little bit and listen to others, um, you see amazing things. And the closer you look, you know, the more amazing things you see. I'm, I'm not sure how diligent I am, so I don't, you know, or in, insight, so I don't really, I'm not a dil diligent person. Very. I'm a crazy person, so that's, you know, but. <laughs> Hi, I really appreciate uh, speaking about transmission, and I think maybe I would love to hear the part you skipped in your talk, but we'll have to do that later. I really want to bring it back to the level of translation, and, and I work on Prajna Paramita, 8,000 line at the moment, and I've had the, you know, the explanations. I have commentators telling me what it means. And it's all very much in my mind originally it was about how do I understand the meanings in order to be able to translate them, put them in my own words. And while I was reading it, this is going back to your idea of bodily communication, something else that's being communicated. But actually, on the, I just have a text in front of me with mm. a lot of other words to supply. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And while I was reading the text, I started to realize that within the text there are other things that are going on. Sort of mm -hmm. like, mm. Um, for instance... An example would be when he's comparing the merit earned by building stupas to the merit earned by writing out mm -hmm. Paramita. He doesn't just say, it's a million times more, it's a billion times more. They repeat the entire mm -hmm. page of paragraph, word for word, mm -hmm. that goes through all these things. And then he comes to the next point and he says, yeah, the only change is it goes from a million to a billion. And then you repeat again. And, mm -hmm. repeat. and mm. at first I was feeling like, Who's going to read this? Mm -hmm. Who's going to listen to this? Mm -hmm. I mean, because words, listen, mm -hmm. read. But I started to get exhausted <laughs> myself. And mm. this exhaustion was very clear to me as an effect of that literary style. 
Which literary style? Of, of the text? repetition. Like, I see, okay. It was inconceivable, but if he just told me it's inconceivable, it wouldn't have a punchline. You know, I needed, to, it's like a joke. You have to bring somebody through it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. I had to have my mind blown by going over it and over it. And over. This is just a very simple example. Every chapter had, I started to kind of pick up on the fact mm -hmm. that every chapter had its own joke, its own setup and its own punchline. <laughs> I'm sure that's true. And it was doing its own thing. And so I started to learn that I need, because of my respect for the text, I didn't just say this is a ramble. This is rambling. Mm -hmm. This is not said as well as it could be said. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. what Konza did. He eliminated five pages and he said, neither a billion, neither a trillion. He just right. took that out. That's often done, yeah. So I, I've been hearing this because of working in this highly esoteric text. I've been hearing this thing, which is, sort of the prioritizing of meaning, mm -hmm. even within words, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and truth value even. Mm -hmm. But there's something to the effect of words. Mm -hmm. That also is related to this transmission, translation mm -hmm. quality mm -hmm. thing. And then everybody knows it's very difficult to translate a joke into another language, especially one that centers around words. And when I'm translating the Prajnaparamita Sutra, I'm sitting there thinking, First of all, what's the joke? And then trying to get the joke <laughs> in Sanskrit. And then trying to think of how I can make that joke in English. Stop thinking about all that stuff. Just, like, just relax. <laughs> you, you say that. You say that. But if I'm, I feel if I'm not finding a way to translate the joke, no, 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 then no. I'm just translating the words. You know, but if you're too worried, then you can't make a joke. So like, that's part of the problem. Well, but, explaining a joke doesn't make it funny. Right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Anyway, I, I really question of agree transmission. Is it really when we're translating these various genres, are we able to transmit them in our culture by just translating words? That's the question. Well, no, I completely agree with you, and it's part of what I was trying to get at. And I, I realized that one of the things that, that was developing when I was thinking about what I wanted to say was there's a, a, maybe a slight difference between the example of of the oral translation and the textual translation, and I was emphasizing in the oral translation, you know, your interaction with the person who's speaking, the human being. But in the textual translation, I think it really has to do with your encounter with the text itself. And one thing just re related to what you were already saying is, you know, I, I think it's really important as a translator also to sort of read the text over and over again and try to allow the text to speak to you on its own terms. There's something about, I think you're completely right, the way the text is set up, the rhetoric, its use of repetition is extremely important. Uh, all kinds of dimensions of the, you know, literary, you know, techniques and strategies, which are not always just about meaning per se, but the text itself, that, that's why I wanted to get away from this idea of intention. There's something that happens when things get textualized that the text itself does its own work. And I think the fact that you recognize that there's something about the repetition of hearing over again, a hundred, a thousand, you know, 10,000. Something is happening to you that's sort of, you know, habituating you, naturalizing you, forcing you to slow down, to shut up, to, to sort of hear what the text is trying to tell you or what the text is saying. That takes a lot of skill, and I completely agree with you. It's not, so, you know, sort of even thinking that there is a joke there, per se, might get in the way. It's something like looking for the meaning, looking for the joke. The, the joke will come out naturally if you, if, if you listen to the text itself long enough, and then you sort of, I mean, it's, it's, it's a really a puzzle. What happens when you put you know, your pen on the paper or you write on your computer, what kind of state of mind are you, are you when you actually, or speaking e even? You kind of are not thinking, just like words come out. And, and so it's a really mysterious process at that very moment when you're actually, you're, you're, you're just speaking out of a space which you have somehow been put into by virtue of what you just heard, so to speak. And you're, anyway, you're very right to talk about the issue of meaning as, and especially word by word meaning is going to lose some of the implications of the way that the sentence is put together, the way one sentence relates to another, the way the 
the, the, the pacing, the timing, and all of that. And I would just want to uh, point to Robert Thurman once more. Um, you know, I mean, whatever you, uh, whatever one might say about his translation of the Vimalakirti Sutra, I will say that you know the spirit. There is, I, there, you, mu you must have been in a great state when you translated that text because the spirit of Vimalakirti. It's a really, really funny text, also, and has a lot of life in it. And that had to be that something that, that you allowed that, or you were in that space itself to kind of con convey that kind of animation, which is a really great thing. I mean, the text itself is a really great text, but yeah. Thank you so much, Janet. That was wonderful.